As you may or may not be aware, the current government is not polling particularly well, and if current trends continue, it will be out on its bottom come the next election. So what we saw over the weekend in Auckland, where the Labour Party, uh, that is the ruling party by majority, held its um, annual conference, was an attempt to pivot or refocus the party on its old class war roots. Them and us, ill workers against capital, against the bosses. Uh, we saw a, a speech from the party president, which talked about being the party and the government for those in the Smoko Rome and not the Koru Club or the Koru Lounge, as uh, she called it. And then uh, we saw a flurry of criticism of uh, a set of organisations that it is easy to dislike, uh, though not always logically, the banking sector, the big banks, who have been going through their annual reporting season. And because they're big and because they're banks, they've made lots of money, billions of dollars which of course makes people who don't have billions of dollars, it makes us a little green with envy and a little angry and it makes the banks a very easy target. So we've had plenty of rhetoric from the government about bank profits. Even the National Party seeking to outflank the wokeness of Labor has engaged in a little bit of this. And then yesterday morning, um, the government announced it was and I like this, working up legislation to introduce open banking to New Zealand. That came from the Commerce Minister, David Clark. He says that will increase bank competition. David Clark, of course, the guy who went cycling and went to the beach during the first COVID lockdown and got fired for it. Open banking is apparently when customers can share their personal financial information with companies other than their bank, creating opportunities to get better deals on mortgages, overdrafts, and comparing insurance and broadband deals. Hmm, strange. Well, to find out what open banking is, what it means, and whether or not any of this will make a blind bit of difference, we are joined for, uh, by Roger Beaumont. He is from the New Zealand Bankers Association, a group that lobbies on behalf of banks, but I might add, does not have a mandate to speak individually for any bank or address the issues of individual profits for any bank. So that is a kind of fence around... Uh, this interview. Roger, welcome to the platform. Nice to have you with us. Thank you, Sean. Good morning. All right. Open. <laughs> Look, I'm a bit, con I'll be honest, I'm a bit confused. As far as I know, my personal information about what interest rate I'm paying and everything, I can share that with anyone I want at the moment, can't I? Uh, that's absolutely correct, Sean. And if you wanted to find a more competitive offer for, for you say, your mortgage renewal, uh, you can uh, freely and openly talk to other banks and decide what the best option for you is. Uh, and you have plenty of choice and you're able to go and uh, do that uh, as it is. We don't need open yeah. banking. In fact, there are apps, and I've done it, I think, for a couple, online and you can compare and, and you go into an app and it's all there. Yeah, you could... Yeah, and you, you type in different. your financial information and it comes up with a thing for you. Correct. So, so, so there, are no, there are no bars on the doors um, at your current bank. Um, there is easy opportunity for you to go and look at alternative options uh, and, and find um, the most appropriate one for you. I think the, the thought of switching banks is actually, um, uh, it's a bigger, bigger mind uh, block than, than the practicality of doing it. It's actually a relatively straightforward process, but it's one of those things that you perceive it's going to be really painful. Yeah, okay. Um, so what, what exactly is the government promising here if it's promising us something we've already got? So w w what, it, what open banking means is that through an API, which is the, 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 the background um, uh, information on your banking data, competitors, be it other banks or even fintech startups, can have access to your banking data to understand your spending behaviours, clearly understand what your salary is uh, and, and know um, your history on a financial transaction basis. And on that basis, the theory is that they can offer you a more competitive uh, rate because they have okay. a better understanding of your financial affairs. But you can provide them with all your banking records yourself, can't you? You can, that's absolutely correct. What this does is make it uh, much more seamless 
uh, and straightforward for customers. The concern here, though... Whoa, 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 uh, hang on, hang on, hang on, Roger. For customers or for financial institutions to share information about their customers with each other? Well, it, it, it's it's for um, customers with their, with their permission, uh, allowing other other financial institutions to, to 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 look at their financial history and data. Okay, can't I do that now? Well, you can't do it um, seamlessly. Um, you would have to, for example, probably request some history of of your statements or print off a whole lot of, of banking statements, and you could provide that to another bank. So that yeah. would give them the same insight, it's just a more seamless process. It doesn't seem a particularly big deal, if I'm going to be honest, Roger. Well, yes, you might say that, Sean. Um, the, 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 and the, what, you the, couldn't the, possibly comment? <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing about it is, and the thing that we're really anxious about, is customer um uh, security of their data is absolutely critical. Yeah, this. so you don't. Yeah, it's a want, big deal because because banks have an obligation to protect customers' data uh, because when you think about it, your banking transactional data tells an awful lot about you. You imagine that leaking because um, some fintech has um, requested your data to uh, give a more competitive um, pricing option on some sort of financial service. Your financial data leaking is a pretty big deal compared to, say, um, your electricity usage data leaking, which is not such a big deal. So open banking and using uh, ha having, having uh, that data go out uh, it, into other competitors, uh, it needs to be framed up in a way that makes sure that your customer, uh, yeah. make sure the customer data is as secure as it can be. Roger, in general terms, yeah, how many customers of banks are screaming that they want this change? Is this something that banks frequently receive complaints about? Uh, in a word, no. Um, and uh, I think the um, the uh, appetite for this is a lot from the technology or fintech startup uh, industry are really keen to do the, this because that uh, actually makes their business model a whole lot easier to engage uh, and, and pursue customers. But um, as I say, there are no bars on the doors at the moment for customers to change banks. You can do that openly and freely. Uh, and all this does is is make that process uh, more seamless. All right. So the government says, Clark says, the key point is that open banking allows customers to shop around for better deals. You're telling us they can already do that. This bank means Correct. banks will also have to work harder to retain their customers, leading to savers for consumers. But if this isn't a problem that customers have identified, that sounds like BS. Well, you know, um, we actually think there's um, quite a bit of uh, confusion about open banking in terms of the Do you think the government market. is confused about open banking, Roger? <laughs> or willfully well, representing its benefits in its political interests? Well, I think the government have been um, talking about this since uh, Minister Farfoy was the Commerce Minister. Uh, so there's been a, a lot of talk about this for some time. Uh, to be honest, we've been expecting this announcement for some time as well. Uh, it's interesting it's come out this week. Do you think it's been spun to look like it's it's part of this current and recent narrative of let's hate the big bag banks? So they've taken something that's kind of just a procedural reform and dressed it up as some, um, I don't know, some shot in the arm for the working classes. Well, I think it's a, I think it's um, a, a timely response on their part to uh, some significant narrative that has uh, taken place this week. Do you agree with that narrative? Do your members agree with that narrative? And we've had a couple of commentators on here saying, God, you don't want banks not making money, then we're all in trouble. Well, that's exactly right, Sean. Uh, if, uh, if show me a, a, an economy with unprofitable banks, and I'll show you an economy you do not want to be a part of. So, um, having strong, robust, profitable banks, particularly as we're heading into some pretty economic, uh, um, economically challenging headwinds, you want your banks to be strong and robust because actually that's how 
the economy gets through because uh, when customers are under pressure and um, feeling the pain, uh, banks having a bit of hay in the barn is a very good uh, position to be in. All right. I know you cannot talk individually about individual banks' profits, but overall, Correct. overall, the banking industry in New Zealand and your members, when we compare internationally, are the profits in New Zealand disproportionate? Uh, in a word, no. So if you look at the um, return on equity of the major banks uh, in this market, um, they sit at around, that's, that return on equity sits at around the, the middle of the pack if you're comparing it with, say, the um, NZX top 50. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, these are big, big businesses. You know, they're dealing with massive balance sheets and they are making an enormous contribution to the economy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the, the contribution banks make in terms of running their business on a day-to-day -day basis, that is employing 27,000 people, paying tax as a business uh, and and actually um, operating their businesses, the amount of money they spend on doing all of that is greater than their combined profits. Yeah, yeah, that is actually, that's a really good point, Roger. Roger, the other thing I'd say, we have seen interest rates climb, obviously, and inflation is up. Um, we are seeing house prices, and I don't hate to say the bubble burst, we're seeing the cycle on a down, downtrend, right, particularly in places like Wellington. Um, our banks, our trading banks, have billions of dollars secured against the housing market in New Zealand, uh, yet we haven't seen a flurry of mortgage sales. It would seem to me that banks have as much invested in the New Zealand economy and do not want it falling into chaos as anyone else. Absolutely, Sean. Uh, and, you know, mortgagee sales, for example, are an absolute last resort for a bank. Nobody wins out of a mortgagee sale, neither the bank and certainly not the customer. So banks will typically only resort to a mortgagee sale when um, there's a breakdown in communication, when the customer won't engage, when there's clearly issues going on, there have been so many mispayments, uh, it just becomes an untenable situation. But banks want to work with customers who might be feeling um, under financial pressure. And there's lots of customers that are feeling under financial pressure because a lot of people, for example, have moved from a mortgage uh, on a fixed rate term with a two in front of it to a mortgage with a six in front of it. That's a material change. Mm -hmm. uh, and banks build in what they call buffer rates when they're approving a mortgage, uh, which means that they allow for an increase in rates um, amongst your household expenses as they do that assessment because banks are, are responsible lenders. And so most people can absorb an increase in rate. Um, the additional challenge that we've got is, of course, skyrocketing cost of living costs. So it's not only your mortgage that's going up, but so are the groceries mm. and everything else. So people are feeling the pressure. And if people are feeling the pressure, we want them to contact, to contact their bank sooner rather than later because the sooner you have that conversation, um, the sooner the bank can help you and uh, make a plan to manage your way through that because that's what banks want to do. They want to walk customers through challenging periods and, and come out the other side of it in good shape mm. because, once again, that's better for everybody. Roger, were you guys expecting or warned of this rhetorical, political, this war of words against banks that came from the government? No, we were completely um, blindsided by it, to be honest. Didn't, didn't see it coming at all. Do you think it is fair and constructive? Well, it's... it's look, I think it's an interesting debate. Um, I think uh, banks are easy to um, beat up on because they are big, um, big businesses um, and they uh, do make a lot of money. But as we've discussed, there are good reasons for that and it's important that banks are profitable. Um, so, you know, we, um, we're, we're an easy punching bag, I guess is what I'm, what I'm saying. Um, but, you know, I'm yet to meet a banker in my 10 years in this industry who genuinely at their heart, doesn't want to be there to help customers. Yeah, um, I, I hear what you're saying then. So what you're telling us this morning is that open banking 
And what well, will open banking in any way lead to a reduction in your profits or reduction in costs to people who use banks? Well, I'm yet to see clear evidence of uh, it impacting bank, bank profitability um, in any of the other markets that's um, come into play, in, in, you know, internationally. Um, but look, anything that enhances giving customer choice is a good thing. But let's be really clear, customers already have that choice. They have a wide range of options and there are plenty of banks in New Zealand uh, for customers to go to as an alternative. Yeah, you're spending plenty on advertising to tell us that too. You could spend some uh, on the platform if you wanted. Um, Very also, generous of you, Joy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, I want to say uh, we'll give you good bang for your buck, I promise. Um, Roger, I also want to say one of the impacts that uh, political rhetoric like this can cause is uh, blowback on social and other media. Have you seen an uptick? in negative comments towards your staff, towards your employees, and on social media about banks. Is this sort of political hate speech feeding through and having a negative impact on your people? Look, I, I, I'm not aware of any any um, uh, uplift in that sort of activity. You know, banks, as I say, are an easy punching bag, and there will always be a degree of um, a, a degree of noise around banks because, actually, when you think about it, banks are always at the centre of some pain points in people's lives. They're paying a yeah. mortgage or paying bills, or you know, it's it's it, it, it's at the centre well, of funny, your financial People um, never say how happy activity. they are when they get the mortgage; they will get the loan for the new car, do they? <laughs> no, well, you know, we do get some lovely comments from customers who, who appreciate the support, and especially those customers who are going through tough times. You know, we do get really nice feedback because, to my comment earlier, bankers want to help. Bankers want to help customers succeed and, and actually, particularly if they're under pressure, get through that, that worrying time. Hey, Roger, I thank you very uh, much for joining us on the platform this morning. That has been most informative. Uh, our discussion, and we'll talk to you again soon. Look forward to it. Cheers, Sean. Cheers. Roger Beaumont, Chief Executive of the Bankers Association. That's kind of the umbrella lobby group for the bank, so he can't speak individually for any bank.